<clears throat> okay, so uh, today is the birthday of Fry Otto. I, I double checked, but I'm still a little bit confused about the correct pronunciation of his name. Uh, it seems the F and R are barely pronounced because uh, if I if I heard correctly, something like I or I you barely hear F F and R, but I still feel uncomfortable. So I will pronounce Fry Otto. Fry Otto, he was German, uh, born in 1925 on the 31st of May. Uh, so uh, you see, 31st of May 1925 was a German architect and structural engineer noted for his use of lightweight structures, in particular tensile and membrane structures, including the roof of the Olympic Stadium in Munich or München for the 1972 Summer Olympics. Otto won the Riba Royal Gold Medal in 2006 and was awarded the Prisker Architecture Prize in 2015, shortly before his death. Well, <laughs> maybe it was uh, the jury made up its mind uh, before his death, but actually um, it was announced officially one day after he died. Anyway, um, this was the man. Um, and uh, still handsome in, in his old age. And he did some, some incredible uh, buildings or structures, should I say. Here he is as a young uh, person. But what is strange about, uh, about Fry Otto is that he was actually a pilot, pilot in the Second World War, of course, fighting for Germany. But at that time, he was only 20 years old. And uh, he was a prisoner of war for a while in the charter in France. And then he studied in the United States, you know, in Berlin. And then he traveled to the United States. He met uh, uh, Mendelssohn. Uh, he met Frank Lloyd Wright, Miss Van der Rohe, Richard Neutra, and so on. But um, kind of strange to me that he was a pilot at such a young age. Maybe, you know, the Nazis were desperate, so they hired people or, you know, they ordered them to serve the, the tragic cause uh, at a very early age. Anyway, uh, he survived the war and he became a, a, a brilliant, uh, I, I don't know, you know, he's, he studied architecture, but uh, uh, it's unclear to me. It seems to me he was more like an engineer than an architect somehow. Some drawings by uh, Fry Otto uh, and uh, he was more than a, than a structuralist, you know. I think he was seduced by the uh, by the complexity and the naturalness and the organic character of what happens in nature, and uh, he tried to build according to those principles that he found uh, he found in nature. So he wanted to create some kind of a balance between order and disorder. Maybe his quest was for the spontaneous order that nature uses. Uh, and um, he was also concerned with, uh, with uh, self-organizing uh, uh, mechanisms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, cities, societies, and so on. Interesting, you know, because in a way you would expect someone who is interested in structure to be less inclined towards such extravagant, extravagant uh, preoccupations. But we see here already in the drawings, uh, insinuations of the unknown, the spiral, you know, there are uh, fragmentations that we certainly don't see the typical grid that we associate with the engineer. This is, uh, this is not by him, but this searching for material about him, I discovered this uh, I don't know exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's done with a Houdini software. Uh, and actually there was a Romanian who, who did this study, Bogdan Lazar, who uh, you know, used Houdini to uh, exemplify something relating to, uh, you know, to the, uh, I don't know, maybe even the philosophy and the aesthetics of Fry Otto. But it's an interesting modeling. And uh, 
I think this, this, this modeling itself should make us think because structure is not just about the grid. It could, you could also have structure that is like the, the, the tissue that, that uh, uh, entraps in a way the hand here that we look at. So structure can also be in this way. This is also part of the same uh, 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 the same site where I, I discovered the previous image. Uh, I think it's called vague terrain. It's, it's very interesting, in fact. And uh, you know, to those who think that the computer destroyed architecture, I would oppose these images because I think the computer, if used uh, properly and creatively and intelligently, didn't destroy architecture at all. Anyway, um, all kinds of drawings done by him or after him uh, looking at his work. He was a structuralist, but he tried to, uh, through his structures, to arrive at the freedom that nature uh, was able to, to uh, convey and act upon. And I think a good engineer is like a good artist, you know, searches for freedom, not for uh, inhibition and not for frozen um, static, uh, uh, you know, uh, expressions of, of, uh, of how, how to build uh, is to be done. Yeah, even here we see that it's, it's about dynamic structure, it's about uh, a, a tissue that uh, seems to evolve, to become, it's open, open-ended. You see occupying and connecting thoughts on territories and spheres of influence with particular reference to human settlement. This was a, a book uh, written by him. And these two concepts, occupying and, content, and connecting, I can only approximate what they could mean because I didn't read the book. But it is about it is about connection and, and it is about uh, 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 a more dynamic system of, of, uh, of creating a human settlement, not rigidly through a, you see here this, this uh, yes, there is a little bit of geometry here, but it's a deformed geometry. It's not, a, it's not these are not regular geometrical figures. Terrain vague. This is, uh, I, I suggest to you, if you are interested, to search for this uh, website. Uh, it's very interesting. Terrain vague. I even like the, the naming, a vague terrain, terrain vague in Romanian, a vague terrain, network, cities, and trees. And uh, unfortunately, let me, let me see if I have here the text. Yes, uh, maybe I should show. This is from from a study he did, and, and uh, you, you see here forms of organization which are not Cartesian. And I think, I think this is what he was after. And this is what he wrote, or this is what someone wrote about his concerns in occupying and connecting. Fry Otto presents in occupying and connecting a theory about the phenomena of urban networks a self-organized systems, surfaces and paths, occupations and territories expansion. All these spontaneous structures grow through two basic processes that organize all natural and humanized spaces, occupation and connection, governed by laws of attraction, repulsion or expansion, contraction, they present emergence and self-organization behavior akin to physical processes in natural patterns. And, and you can see here, you know, like in the, in the old medieval towns or the old medieval cities, uh, you know, they, they grew spontaneously. And the charm of the medieval world is perhaps a result of this spontaneity, which we don't have any longer compare a modern city with a medieval city and you see two different kinds of um, you know organizational um, uh, you know strategy so to speak although I, I i'm not sure if the middle if the middle ages had a strategy but it was an organic development of the town of the city and anyone who visited a me medieval town or city 
would acknowledge that it's a different kind of organization than what we have in a modern one. Because in the modern city, the will of the, the urbanist or the will of the architect is, uh, is uh, all powerful. And, uh, you know, here we have straight streets, uh, you know, 90 degrees angles, uh, perfect uh, intersections and so on, objectivism. But in terms of emotions, in terms of, you know, the fluidities of life, I think the modern city is deficient, is rigid, it's cold, it's uninspiring very often. So, you know, what urban is today would, would make an urban scheme like the drawings we see here. Very few, if at all. But, uh, but this is how nature works. And this is how, until the Renaissance, also, not always, because in the Roman times, in the Roman Empire, and usually empires like uh, Cardo and Decumanus, like 90 degrees angles and straight lines. But uh, societies that are less ambitious are happy to live in, in approximations of what we see in this drawing. Top projects, seven top projects by uh, 2015 Pritzker Prize Laureate Fry Otto, Fry, Fry Otto. This, what you see behind here, behind him is a, is a building he built with Shigeru Ban. Uh, but we are going to look at it more in detail. So first, let's start with this roof for the 1972 Munich Olympic Stadium, which is a brilliant work. Uh, Munich, of course, stands for München. Uh, designed in collaboration with Günther Bergnisch, uh, the roofing for the 1972 Munich Olympic Stadium was considered a pioneer in lightweight tensile and membrane construction. The cloud-like and innovative structure was a striking departure from the harsh and authoritarian appearance of previous roofing structures and helped present a new, lighter face of Germany to the world. Covered in acrylic glass panels, the suspended membrane delicately floats above the stadium and maintains views out towards the surrounding landscape. Indeed, you know, these words are correct, delicately floats above the stadium or the cloud-like uh, structure. And here they are. And uh, this is what, uh, this is why perhaps he is relevant for our time because some of these structures uh, and, or some, some of these fluidities are, 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 are you know, more easily uh, arrived at today because of um, the new, you know, uh, scripting, programming, uh, parametrics, all the, all the technologies that we have at our disposal would make something like this, um, you know, uh, more easy to, to accomplish. But when he worked in 1970 something, uh, he, you know, he didn't have these uh, softwares at his disposal. And yet, he conceived and he built this very elegant and very uh, inspired and inspiring uh, structure. It is, a, I think, a beautiful roofing because it is uh, light uh, visually and it's also light in spirit. And, you know, this was done through calculation, but the feeling is of uh, something very graceful. Uh, almost uh, beyond numbers. I like it very much. This is a democratic uh, architecture, uh, light in spirit and light uh, physically, that uh, that uh, proclaims, uh, uh, you know, something that is positive, optimistic, uh, and uh, you know, in a way, is the opposite of the mega monolithic heavy structures. These are very lightweight but they also, they have significant dimensions, as you can see.
So the work of man doesn't have to be necessarily uh, in opposition to the way nature works. And uh, you look at the visual aspects of, of what he did. It's, it's something graceful and organic. Uh, it's rigorous, yes, but it's not rigid. It's not heavy. It was a success. Now, of course, it, it is. You cannot. Uh, you cannot not be uh, uh, rigorous here. You have to be rigorous, and you know German. Uh, German made uh, things are usually very rigorous. So we, we see here a perfect, a perfect uh, construction. But, uh, you know, be, behind uh, the perfection or maybe beyond the perfection, uh, the, the technical perfection is the poetry of the structure, which is uh, for all to see. And I, I like very much this fact that it is on one hand an, uh, a technological uh, artifact. Uh, it's, it's highly technological, but its spirit is poetical. Very elegant. And you can see it's huge. I mean, you know that it's you know in the previous pictures you don't realize actually the the diameter of those uh, almost cylinder-like uh, poles. But if you compare them with the silhouettes of the human beings, you realize they are huge. Amazing work. So yes, the very same human beings who created the, 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 the deadly Second World War also created something like this. The human being can do both, can choose to, to, to bring death upon the earth or can choose to use their creativity and their hard work and their imagination to, to say yes to life, not to say no. Unfortunately, even today, uh, you know, people prepare for war. And there is an interview with Frank Lloyd Wright when Frank Lloyd Wright was 88 years old. And uh, the, the one who interviewed him asked him uh, what he thought about, I don't know, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, military development of the American uh, army. And, and he said, if you love peace, why do you arm yourself even more? And I think his question was legitimate. Now, it's true, was the question of a poet, essentially, not of a pragmatic man. But there are those who think that only by arming ourselves with more and more sophisticated arms, we can avoid war. But uh, Frank Lloyd Wright asked, if you love peace, why do you arm yourself more and more? So it, it's a complex issue. But unfortunately, the human beings who created this beautiful roof, uh, I'm not referring to the Germans, to any human being, we are all together in this, you know. We can choose be, be between being creative and, 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 and uh, accepting positive values, or we can choose destruction. And uh, unfortunately, there is uh, some kind of a dialectic between uh, destroying and, and constructing or building. It seems we cannot avoid um, uh, this tension between the two, unfortunately. But this is a great work. 
and um, it's it's physical but it's also metaphysical i would say because of the its gracefulness now uh, another brilliant work for this uh, multi-purpose hall in mannheim in germany uh, he worked with another architect here yes his name is mentioned so completed in 1975 over the course of five years the multi hall is topped by a double curvature wooden grid shell structure designed by Otto, Karlfried uh, Mutschler, and Joachim Lang Langner. The large span grid shell was made for a horticultural exhibition in Mannheim in Germany and covers an area of nearly 9,500 square meters. Listed as a historical cultural monument since 1998, this timber lattice self-supporting roof structure allows diffused light into the building and creates a sense of weightlessness inside. Indeed, it is like this. And, you know, I mean, this is the magic of flexible thinking. This is the magic of that spontaneous order that science discovered that nature works with. It's not rigid, it's not based on a grid. It's logical, it's, uh, it's, uh, regular, it's, uh, it's rigorous, but it's not rigid. And, uh, you know, these curvatures that you get are, are, are magic, magical. And yet it is based on a system. It is based on reason, but it, it's, uh, it is also based on some kind of a poetical, uh, um, I don't know how to call it, gracefulness. Look at this beautiful roofing. You know, it's magical. Uh, it's, it, it, and it's self-supporting. Do we see here columns? Well, there are some things here, but the, the vastness of the roof is incredible and it's lightweight and it stands. And it's, it looks great even from the outside. Now, I don't know why the, there were three architects there. Otto, Fry Otto was one of them, but I imagine he had an important uh, input. Uh, uh, and uh, unfortunately, what is underneath the roof is less gracious, but the, the roofing is great. Uh, I, I wonder what Le Corbusier would have thought if he would have uh, written or if he would have thought about still the virtues of the right angle if he saw something like this. Because as you know, Le Corbusier wrote Le Poem de Longue Le Droit, the poem of the right angle, uh, of the 90 degrees angle, or yes, the right angle. Um, but uh, yeah, there are virtues in other angles as well, and even getting rid of, of angles altogether. On the other hand, Zaha Hadid was right. If there are 360 de uh, you know, degrees, why do we use only one? So yes, it is the work of man or of the human being, but on the other hand, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a work which does not uh, provoke nature or insult nature. It's still, uh, you know, fluid and organic. And, uh, and uh, as, as such, I think nature would uh, agree with it. Now we see the, uh, an earlier work uh, in Montreal at the uh, Universal Exposition or Exhibition from 1967. Uh, I will read a short text. The Expo 67, the West German Pavilion Roof, was a competition-winning tensile membrane design that took Otto and collaborator Rolf Goodbrod several years to develop. Thanks to careful design and the form-finding structural engineering principle called dynamic relaxation, interesting uh, conjunction between these two words, dynamic relaxation. The structure took only six weeks to construct and upon completion was the first tent ever used as an exhibition building at a world exhibition. 
The roof comprises a steel wire net fastened to eight slender steel masts that was then covered by a translucent plastic skin. The pivotal turning point in the late Fry Otto's career, capped by last month, this is when this person, David Longton, Longton uh, wrote this text, uh, the last month's Pritzker announcement, so this was a text from 2015, came nearly 50 years ago at the Expo 67 World's Fair in Montreal, Quebec. In collaboration with architect Rolf Goodbrod, Otto was responsible for the exhibition pavilion of the Federal Republic of Germany, a tensile canopy structure that brought his experiments in lightweight architecture to the international stage for the first time. Together with Fuller's biosphere and Moshe Safdie's habitat, Sex 67, the German pavilion was part of the Expo's uh, late modern demonstration of the potential of technology prefabrication and mass production to generate a new humanitarian direction for architecture. This remarkable collection at the Expo was both the zenith of modern meliorism, I don't know what meliorism is, and its tragic swan song. Never since has the world seen such a singularly hopeful display of innovative architecture. Well, I don't know about this, but this is the world. Unfortunately, with these structures, you know, um, then these tensile structures, you know, after a while, you discover the, the uh, modus vivendi, the way of being, and uh, they look a little bit similar. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the level of novelty uh, strikes you at, at, at the first but, but then later on, uh, you know, you see resemblances between what he did here and the first work uh, we saw in, um, in München. Uh, but still, it is a, an impressive work. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, indeed, it, it, it proclaims this uh, light spirit, uh, this democratic and optimistic spirit that that uh, writer tried to, uh, uh, try to convey. But now that I think about it, the tent itself, the idea of the tent uh, connects architecture with its very beginnings and with that mysterious, um, um, you know, uh, uh, development from text, which means to weave that apparently all words relating to architecture derive from. You know, when you think of a tent, you think inevitably of textile work. And uh, as such, this, this kind of work has a certain, you know, uh, femininity, I would say, and being light in spirit is, uh, is the opposite of, of the masculinist um, uh, realities of what uh, very often architecture is about. There is also uh, this 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 feeling that this is something uh, you know is not eternal, it's temporary, it's fragile. But there is a, there is a, uh, in a way the a stubbornness of what is fragile. As someone even said the paradox that nothing is as permanent as what is temporary. This is also, look at this, you know, it's a beautiful, uh, I mean, uh, visually speaking, aesthetically speaking. It's, uh, it's uh, very light and yet the shape is, is organic and is surprising and it's, it's, it's gracious. Now the Japan paper pavilion, this he built uh, with Kishikeru Ban for the Expo 2000 in Hanover in Germany, but it was the, the Japanese pavilion. So Fry Otto designed the Japan pavilion for Expo 2000 in collaboration with Shigeru Ban, 
who received a Pritzker Prize one year earlier in 2014. Constructed entirely from paper, the grid shell pavilion is made up of recyclable paper tubes without joints. The airy tunnel arch me measures 73 meters long and 25 meters wide. It's incredible. Honeycomb boards were used as partitions in the interior. And here it is. Can you believe it? Done with paper. But uh, there is a but here, I would say. You know, uh, yes, technically speaking, is a, is an amazing uh, structure. But uh, I would say that somehow this uh, this uh, concern with uh, with uh, with technology and with the structure, in terms of the surprises that architecturally the building offers is less somehow for me less convi convincing i mean you know technically yes it is uh, it is striking but aesthetically is it so amazing in my opinion the pavilion that yanis xenakis uh, built uh, together with le corbusier in, in, in brussels was superior in as architecture so maybe we can reflect <clears throat> on the on the <clears throat> on the on the relationship between structure and architecture. I don't think you can have a significant architecture just with, with structure. But when structure assumes the dimensions of ornament, when it becomes ornamental in a way, when it becomes aesthetically pleasing, then yes, it moves towards architecture. Yes. Yet architecture, I think, is, is more complex. That's why perhaps Walter Gropiu said that architecture begins where engineering ends. He put it maybe too uh, you know, harshly, but there is some, some truth there. Here, you know, in my opinion, this work is less inspired than the, the works we saw earlier. It's actually heavier. Uh, and uh, in spirit and visual. The amazing thing is that it was done with paper, yes. And the span is, 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 is uh, you know, uh, impressive. But otherwise, aesthetically, I'm not very impressed. You know, it's, I don't know what to say. It, it seems more uh, enclosed somehow. It's not open. It's not airy. It's not as graceful as what we saw earlier. Yes, during construction is interesting because it's not finished, so it's open-ended. So becoming is still present, but when it was finalized, you know, I don't know. But but still, you know, considering that it was done with uh, with uh, with a lot of paper here or paper tubes, is incredible. Although I see here also wood, so it's not just. Uh, you know, paper tubes. The paper tubes are here, but this is wood. Now, anyway, the, the, the size is amazing. I mean, look at the, you know, this is a human being and look what's going on here. It's a, it's, 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 it's a huge, it's a huge effort and a huge structure. Now the diplomatic club heart tent in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia Completed in 1980, the diplomatic club heart tent serves as the centerpiece to the interior garden of Riyadh's diplomatic quarter. The beautiful canopy is made from 2028 millimeter thick tiles of stained glass painted with colorful and traditional patterns created by Bettina Otto, Fry Otto's daughter. The canopy helps protect visitors from the powerful sun and is made from cable net construction. Uh, yes, the, the, the Arab world. Now, I don't know if he made also these uh, thick walls here. I don't know. I should have searched, but I didn't yet. But he made these. So 
So political buildings don't have to be, you know, uh, strict and rigid. They can also be fluid and, uh, you know, welcoming. And uh, I'm glad that they built something like this for, uh, you know, uh, essentially a political function. Now, the Munich Zoo aviary, uh, and I, I, I plan to, to search for the translation of this word. I, I could imagine what it means, but I don't actually know, and I apologize. Maybe one of you will, will search right now what it means. Um, it's a zoo, but uh, let's read. Maybe we will find the answer here. In collaboration with Georg Gribble and Ted Happold, Fry Otto designed a large aviary for the Munich Hellerbrunn, the world's first geo zoo located in Munich in Germany. The innovative and thin stainless steel mesh canopy creates a cage-free like environment for the animals. The site covers an area of 5,000 square meters with a height of 18 meters. Uh, I think it's very beautiful uh, the idea to create a you know, uh, an enclosure which almost uh, vanishes. Now look, <laughs> it seems someone is here on top of this mesh, you know, it's almost like uh, flying. Uh, and yes, it is amazingly, uh, uh, you know, uh, thin and, and transparent. And uh, what can we say? I, I, I am amazed. I don't know what the animals uh, felt or would feel here uh, but um, it, it is graceful, this, uh, this uh, covering that, that uh, Otto, Fry, Otto, uh, Fry Otto did. It's essentially a, a, a curtain, no? an embroidered curtain, very, very uh, delicate, which from a distance seems to disappear, to vanish. It might confuse the birds, you know, and uh, by the way of birds, do you know that uh, <clears throat> there is a problem <clears throat> when you use a lot of glass for uh, office towers? There are um, great dangers for birds because the birds could hit the glass walls. They see the sky reflected by the glass surface of the, of the, the enclosure of the, the office tower and they die. And... Um, you know, so, you know, this uh, between illusion and reality, sometimes the frontier is, is thin and dangerous. It is an interesting work, but unfortunately, the last work that I present in, in this presentation, it, and it will follow, shows something that uh, uh, maybe we should discuss about. Because even here, you know, yes, this uh, structure, uh, from certain uh, points of view appears to be almost uh, vanishing, but uh, in truth, it, it exists, is there, and it is an enclosure. It is an enclosure, it is not open. So, uh, yes, on one hand it protects, but in, on, on the other hand it separates. It separates the human being and the animal alike who are underneath this umbrella from the sky, from, uh, you know, the way things were made a long time ago. And I don't know, is it right? Is it the best we can do? Yes, you protect, but on the other hand, you also separate. It's, it's exactly like uh, in a museum where the artworks are protected, but they are also separated from the place of birth, you know, and um, I don't have an answer. I'm just asking a question. What is the best way to, you know, uh, yes, here we protect, but look at it. If we compare the trees here 
with the trees here, there is clearly a difference. This tree is free. This tree is not. So, and uh, the question becomes even more uh, intense or, or legitimate uh, when we see the following work. I mean, to cover nature with a blanket, doesn't matter how gracefully done, is still uh, to limit actually uh, nature. And this is the last work that I show by Fray Otto, uh, City in the Arctic proposal. He didn't build it, but he made a, a project and, and we are going to see uh, some images. But first, let me read some text. City in the Arctic was Otto's visionary proposal to house the 40,000 residents within an air supported city dome in Antarctica. Creative engineers at Ove Arup in 1971, the pneumatic dome stretches two kilometers across and would be built on an, it was not built, and would be built on an estuary for easy access to shipping routes. A nuclear power station would provide heat and energy to the dome and would help keep the harbor ice free. The proposed canopy would be constructed from a translucent skin attached by a grid of high strength polyester fiber cables. Uh, here is an image. It reminds me a little bit of that uh, Louvre Museum that uh, Jean Nouvel built. Uh, and uh, this, uh, you know, uh, view from the top. I don't know what to think of. I mean, I kind of know what I feel and think, but uh, I, I, I don't agree here with Fry Otto. It's uh, this idea to, 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 again, you know, create a paradise beneath a, a cupola or a dome is not only his. Buckminster Fuller wanted to do the same thing in Manhattan and uh, Jean Nouvel did it at the Louvre in, uh, I think, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I don't know. To me, it's a little bit uh, artificial and uh, authoritarian, you know, uh, where the architect in a godlike position places this huge umbrella above uh, 40,000 uh, uh, people uh, you know, settlement. And it's, let's, let's read a little more. Fry Otto's proposal to house 40,000 people under a two kilometer dome. So the diameter of the dome was supposed to be two kilometers in the Arctic Circle reflecting the zeitgeist of the 1970s. A concern about the ecological future combined with the promise of a better tomorrow. The beginning of the 70s was a heady time for architecture. The oil and energy crisis were still to hit. Postmodernism was still a marginal heresy practiced by cranks. And despite maybe a sense of boredom at the same old, uh, the same old concrete, the tide was yet to fully turn against state architecture. The overwhelming impression was one of accelerating development. Humans were on the moon. New technologies such as computing and new materials such as plastics were forging ahead and desire for social change was bubbling, bubbling over. There was every reason to think that this new movement in which governments planned and built entire new cities for thousands of people would continue and progress. The Arctic city would be sited on an estuary with a harbor for shipping access and an airport on the outskirts. The city would be built in tandem with a nuclear power station, which would provide energy as well as heating the air for the city and the water of the harbor to keep it perpetually ice free. You know, even this thing, why should the harbor be continually perpetually ice free? The first, it's actually going against nature, is it not? The first stage of construction was to prepare the site by digging a set of external foundations in a two kilometer wide ring, then a grid of cables formed from a newly developed high strength polyester fiber rather than steel would be laid across the site and fixed together. The double layer translucent pillows that would create the screen skin would then be attached 
before the entire dome was inflated to a height of 240 meters at its peak. By not building from steel, the roof could behave as a skin rather than a true dome, meaning that it would be less susceptible to wind, snow, and changing loads. Once the dome was inflated and the internal pressure was at the correct balance, the city inside could be built. There would be four main entrances and exits, and they would connect to the various external facilities. And of course, the industrial area, which would be the city's main purpose. Let's not uh, neglect this. The city's main purpose would be the industrial area. A submerged ring road in the dome would connect the housing with the central administration area and recreation district, while pathways and moving sidewalks at ground level would lead between the various functions. And now we see some images of this uh, man-made uh, so-called heaven, but I have doubts about it. And now with the climate change, you know, the, the icebergs are melting, uh, that bear uh, will run away and um, I don't know about how happy the greetings from the Arctic city uh, would really be. Yes, the watercolor seems to be uh, happy, but uh, I don't know. Inside, be beneath the dome, the city would be, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a modernistic, uh, you know, already seen, uh, uh, you know, a uh, human settlement, nothing so special. Yes, from above the dome, it looks interesting, but uh, underneath the dome, kind of the old story, except that it was supposed to be covered with this huge uh, dome. And I, 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 I personally think it's too ambitious and too alienating from how the world was created. Of course, we have problems. Of course, we are not only nature. Of course, there, is, there are tensions between the human being and the many vicissitudes that we are confronted with. But this, maybe, maybe architecture is not supposed to just say, we'll solve all problems for the comfort of human beings. I mean, look at this, uh, whatever it is, an iceberg. Well, this iceberg is melting down. So uh, uh, anyway, he didn't know this. But we know this now. And look at the architecture underneath the dome. It's very banal. So the only so-called spectacular thing is that uh, this thing was built above our buildings or the buildings. I personally wouldn't like to be this kid here, separating from, separated from the sky. You know, protected, yes, but somehow in a frigid and for me, uh, uninspired way. Uh, I also think that what Jean Nouvel did for the Louvre is not great. I admire Jean Nouvel. I think he's maybe the best European architect. Uh, but but uh, in that work, it's nice what he did underneath the dome, but not the dome itself, which is very authoritarian, very regular. It's a circle. It's a, it's, it's, it expresses centrality and power and uh, godlike uh, god -like disposition. Here, again, the buildings are kind of like in the Louvre Museum by uh, Jean Nouvel, more free organized because yes, you know, in, in tension, in, 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 uh, in uh, opposition to the, the old domineering uh, umbrella, you need to, but you are still trapped, you know? I mean, uh, Fray Otto seems to tell you, you are free to do whatever you want to do underneath my dough. And uh, I don't know, that is uh, uh, kind of limiting, is it not? I mean, uh, look at that, you know. Anyway, and this is the last picture on the presentation uh, of the presentation on Fray Otto. And uh, I understand that uh, architecture is uh, perhaps uh, the art of optimism, but uh, yesterday was the birthday of a great uh, German um, uh, historian. Um, yesterday or the day before yesterday? No, I think yesterday, uh, Oswald Spengler, who said uh, optimism uh, is uh, cowardice. 
uh, a controversial statement, but maybe we should think about it, you know. The optimism of the architect maybe is only uh, partially warranted, you know. Uh, we are not gods. We are not godlike. We have uh, great attributes, we have intelligence, we have qualities, but we cannot uh, control everything through the human will. That's why I'm a little bit skeptical of what he proposed here.